Well, welcome to the Wellness uh, Native Wellness Power Hour. Today we had uh, Joseph scheduled. However, she is having some technical difficulties with the internet. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, share some stories with you today, uh, hoping that uh, Jolene can get on. And I just want to welcome you all here. I, I hope that you've all been enjoying what we've been doing the last couple of weeks with the Wellness uh, wellness, wellness Power Hours. I know we've enjoyed it ourselves. We've enjoyed uh, seeing some of you come on, seeing your comments. Whenever I see someone there, like Crystal Sam, I say, how you? How are you doing? Hope you're doing well. You know, and, and today is really um, uh, the start of another great week of sharing. And I know we have some uh, people coming up that are really exciting. I know that you're going to enjoy. So I just, you know, I, I got the call maybe about 10 minutes ago. Hey, can you jump on? I, I'm not going to be able to do this. So just uh, bear with me here a little bit as we share some stories. First of all, just um, from the uh, Choctaw and uh, Muscogee people, the song I was singing as I started off was uh, a, a Choctaw. It's a social dance, a uh, five-step uh, war dance is what it's called. One thing I love about the Choctaw culture that I've learned is that uh, the strength of the women and how the women are involved so much with the culture and so much uh, of playing that vital role. You know, one of the teachings is that if men cannot hold their end of the bargain, uh, so to speak, or cannot do their roles, that the women are ready to step up and uh, take over. So again, I uh, want to thank you for joining us. Uh, like I said, I know some of you might have turned in ready to see Jolene's great smile and hear her laugh. Unfortunately, she's having some internet issues that they're trying to take care of. So I wanted to just share a couple of things. And uh, the first story I want to share uh, is with this right here, with this staff, this uh, Red Wheel staff here. Um, now, this was a gift from Charlie Tellfeathers. And I just want to have you take a quick look at that right there. The one thing I uh, forgot to do uh, to start this off is if you see right there, there's a place to uh, hang the eagle feathers. So I have an eagle feather fan that, uh, again, made from the tail feathers from Charlie Tail Feathers, who gave this to me. And over the years, some of these beads and these thing ties have been given to me and placed on here. I started off with seven of these and have given all of them out except for this last one. And I'll tell you a little bit about where this came from as it's part of the story. Um, this uh, staff um, is what you would call medicine. And you know, Charlie put his own touch on it. If you look right there, uh, can you see it? The Native Wellness um, logo. I know it's kind of hard to see right there, uh, but Charlie saw this part, like the road that goes in our logo, you know, as you see right there. And so he uh, put the rest of it over there, too. I think that was really cool for him to do that. Um, and, and, and so what I wanted to share is about this uh, staff, because um, this happened several years ago. I, wow, it's been it's been a while. And I got a call from... Uh, Red Lake. Um, got a call. Bijou, if any people from Red Lake, Red Lake are on right now. But I got a call from Red Lake to come on out. And um, the reason I got the call, I don't know if you remember back. Uh, it's been about 13, 14 years now. Um, there was a traumatic event that happened at Red Lake High School. There was a school shooting. And um, when that happened... There was a lot of talk going around about what are the uh, best ways, not only uh, to prevent things like this from happening in our school systems, in our communities, but also what can we do to help our people move forward from a uh, catastrophic event like this. 
there was a lot of talk going around different people and I had the chance to listen to the um, at the time the uh, uh, chairman of the community speak and I noticed just how much care and compassion he had um, chairman uh, uh, Buck Jordan how much compassion he had for the young people and how much he was really involved with knowing what was going on in their lives um, and we all you know we were there as presenters and he got some he got my contact information and then I got a call about going out to Red Lake uh, what would be the two year anniversary of when the shooting had occurred and I want to let you know back in the back at that time I was really kind of still what would you say understanding what the healing journey is and, and, and still learning on my own and still learning about tools and still learning about the power of healing and so I was a little bit skeptical I even said you know I'm, I, are you sure I'm the person that you want to call I mean there's so many great people out there there's so many elders out there um, in my mind what healing was was about not only lifting their spirits but also about using the right medicines for them, using the right ceremonies for them. So there was a little bit of um, fear there. Hi, cousin, Stephanie. <laughs> and, um, but again, uh, what really made me uh, determined to be out there is when he said that it was the young people who were asking for me. And so I did what I had to do for myself. And what I did was a fast and not, you know, seeking whatever advice and knowledge that I've been taught before and, and also seeking the knowledge at the time from the elders and my mentors. Um, I decided to do that fast. And it wasn't just what you would call a physical fast, which is, you know, not just the eating. I refer to it as a spiritual fast. And what a spiritual fast for me was during that time was not uh, just three days of prayer, uh, but also I wanted to make sure that, you know, I, I the only thing I had during that time was water for three days. Um, but I also didn't do any television. I also didn't listen to music, radio. We didn't have as much internet at the time. I was never really big internet guy at that time, but I also had my uh, phone, uh, wasn't on, you know, we didn't have all these social media platforms, but anyway, I was taking a break from all of that. I, I, I just focused on myself and my prayers and the people who needed healing and, and, and the students of Red Lake, the community of Red Lake. The other thing that I was uh, doing during that time was I was singing a lot of songs, uh, songs that I had uh, in my head, songs that I have learned. It was a chance for me to reconnect with songs that I was introduced to, such as some Choctaw songs. Um, and it was, it, it was a time in my life that I'd never experienced. And, you know, and I did it in my home in a way and the, the, it, it's sort of like what is happening right now. It was a self-isolation, but I, again, I cut myself off from everything that was going around. I cut myself off from, you know, television, the news. I cut myself off from all that, all that things. And, um, so the thing uh, uh, I was really focusing on during that time is what, it, what do I have? What's the medicine that I carry? Because, you know, inside of us, we all have what's called internal medicine. And the internal medicine is the strengths, the resiliency, the, the things that we've learned. All, all of our teachings is a form of medicine. Anything that we do is a form of medicine. And I was calling upon all that. What is, what is all that I have that I can share with them? And so... When I, after the three days, and here's the amazing thing of it, <clears throat> on the end of the third day, it ended at three o'clock on a Tuesday, and I wasn't hungry. I wasn't, you know, that that's the first thing in my mind. I thought when you come to the end of this fast, you're going to want to like sit down. And I was even telling myself, don't overeat, you know, don't go crazy out there. Hello, Billings. Hello, Squamish. Hi, Craig. Um, hi, Eileen. Um, I, I, I was really telling myself to be prepared because I'm going to have these hunger cravings, you know, three days without food. But when that three o'clock hit, I wasn't hungry. And we usually did an open gym on the Tuesday nights at Salt River High School. 
and I remember then too, like I didn't want to necessarily, was it at the high school or the gym? I think it was Salt River Rec Gym. And I didn't want to go because I knew I'd be hungry and there'd be no purpose for me being there. Um, I wouldn't have the energy, but I had the energy and I went and I didn't expect to play, but I got out there and I was playing ball and, you know, it was just, uh, I felt really great. And you would think after three days of fasting, you wouldn't have the energy, but I didn't have that problem. And I came home, I already had some food ready to go and um, I didn't eat big. I just ate enough. And I never felt that for the next day. Like I never engorged out in food. I never, it it just felt good. And I think that's what we call that spiritual fast of that cleansing is that when you let your spirit take over, it allows your body to heal the way it needs to heal. It allows your mind to be in the places where it needs to be. And I'm really glad that I did that because here, here's where the story gets really, really interesting. So I take this staff with me and the, uh, I shared a little bit about it already, but it was important for me to take this with me. And I, I traveled with it a couple of times <clears throat> with no issues, no problems. But here I am, I'm going to, um, I'm going over to uh, uh, Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport. And in my mind, I had seen people, uh, and and again, this was maybe a couple years, two or three years after uh, 9-11. And when 9-11 happened, you know, the airport real tight on security. Everyone was really just kind of fearful, a lot of fear out there. Uh, and so, but I, I saw that when people went to the uh, security line, they would put their canes on the uh on the x-ray machine as it goes by. So I said, okay, well, I'll do that with this. You know, I, I wasn't going to check it. I was going to carry it with me. And so when I got there, I put it on the belt and I had wrapped up this part right here. So you couldn't see anything from here to here. Um, but I wrapped it up. I don't keep my eagle feathers on here. Uh, they were somewhere else secure, but I put it on the belt <clears throat> and watched it go through. And no problem, but then they came and they pulled me out of the line. And I was surrounded by two security officers at the time who just came and pulled me outside to uh, just just over to the side. And s- soon there was three more security officers that came out and they were carrying the big guns, you know, the, the, the big uh, 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 um, assault rifles. And they surrounded me. Now, when I say they had them out, I don't mean like they had it aimed at me. What I meant is, what I mean is, they had it out like this, and they surrounded me. And at any time, you know, I mean, you're in a situation like that again. What what happens? It's fear. Uh, sometimes when we feel that fear, there's aggression. Sometimes there's there's just this uh, shutdown that we have. There's the freeze or or. My response at the time, <clears throat> and I call it very surprising, was very, very calm. And it was uh, very calm because I think because of the, the fasting that I did, I think because of being in touch with myself, uh, singing those songs, singing those prayers, but also my determination to be there for those young people there who uh, were going through a tough time. <clears throat> and so... What had happened is I stood there and I asked, you know, when I asked what this is about, they said they they asked me just to stand there and there'll be someone there to talk to me about it. And then so someone comes up and he says, and he's carrying this, and he says, this isn't going to go on the airplane. Um, And I asked him, how come? And he said, it's a security risk. And I was, uh, you know, I was angry. I, I, you know, I was angry, but at the same time, very, very calm. And um, I said, well, what are my options? And he said, well, you can leave with it and give it to somebody, but you're not going to get on the plane with it. And I told him, well, I need to get on the plane with it because this is medicine to our people. This is a sacred item and this is going to go on there with me. And he said, it's not. So... I asked if there was someone else who is higher than him, if I could speak to, and he said it would be a supervisor. And I told him, okay, I'd like like to speak to your supervisor. So he said, well, the supervisor is already on his way out. When the supervisor came out, um, he saw this. 
But also he was, he saw a necklace that I was wearing and the necklace I was wearing was a gift from the whole tribe. It was a cedar wood carved into one of their uh -huh. uh, canoe paddles. <clears throat> and I was wearing it, a real beautiful uh, necklace gifted from the whole tribe. And he pointed right at the necklace and said, that's not going on either. So here we are standing in the airport, surrounded by security, surrounded by guns and being told that this is not welcome on the plane and the necklace I was welcome on the plane. It was really hard for me to not think that I wasn't welcome on the plane because of that. But again, in the back of my mind, uh, there was a sense of like, everything's going to be fine. And I started to hear these songs. And these were songs that I was learning at the time, the, the Choctaw songs. And just as I kept those songs just playing in my head, and at the same time, I, I thought of my grandpa. My grandpa isn't, the grandpa I was thinking of isn't Choctaw. He's uh, Muscogee Creek. But I was just thinking of him, and I was just thinking of the strength that he had. And I even thought of his laughter, like, because uh, 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 the laughter was his strength that he had. And I even thought about the times that he prayed for people. Uh, I, I thought about the times, you know, when we go to McDonald's and he has us all pray at McDonald's as we're opening up our Happy Meals, right? I thought about the times where he prayed for a, the waitress who was serving us at uh, one of the uh, Denny's or one of the uh, restaurants out here. Just the strength that he had during times. <clears throat> and as I sang, and again, I wasn't singing Muskogee uh, Creek songs that were in my head. I was singing these Choctaw songs that just brought me the strength. So, um, one of the guys asked, uh, well, the, the, one of the head of the security asked me, so what, what is this? And I said, this is what I carry my eagle feathers with. This is a sacred item. This is medicine to our people. And I'm going out to Red Lake to be with these students who are having a hard time to be with this community and I do prayers with them and I'm going to share with them. And I want to take, I'm, I'm going to take this on with me. And they said, well, you could see where we would think it was a weapon. And um, so my remark to them was like, um, no, um, this would do more harm to me if I used it in that way, um, because this is not the intention. This is wasn't given to me in that spirit. Uh, this is meant to be something for healing. And then one of them. I didn't hear him directly, but, you know, it's kind of like, this is what I think he said under his breath. Something like, yeah, until you start hitting someone up, someone with it. Um, and again, I, I, I didn't get upset. What I was doing was just calming myself down and not let them trigger me. Because if I trigger them, I didn't want to trigger them, if you know what I mean. And, and, and so just very, very calm and just letting those songs soothe me as I awaited what they were going to do. So what the supervisor said, he was going to check in with the airline. And when he did that, one of the officers, uh, he was a, uh, my, in my guesstimate and, you know, I not, I say it's a guesstimate because I wasn't a hundred percent sure. I, I didn't ask, I should have asked, but I, to me, what I looked at him was a Filipino person who came up to me and start, uh, one of the guards, and he asked, he was the first person to really ask, and what he asked was about this, if the colors meant something. And so what I shared with him is that, well, the colors represent all of us, um, you know, the colors, what I was told from Charlie when he gave this is the white represents not just white people, uh, but all the people who have come over, you know, the, from the seas, who've come over, who've traveled over to this land, to Turtle Island. The red represents the indigenous people that were already there. Uh, the yellow there <clears throat> represents the future generations. And the green there represents the land. And what I shared with them with these teachings is tells me is that we're all in this together. And for him, what I also told, um, and. And at, keep in mind that this part was wrapped, but I told him that this tells my story and I could show him at this part here is that, you know, I look at this as my lifeline right here. 
And my lifeline is everything that's right here, which includes them, which, in, which includes the land, which includes my ancestors, that this is my lifeline. And again, I had this part wrapped so I didn't see this. But I also told him here too that this is where, see this part in here is my lifeline where it's more certain, more certain uh, that it's uh, more entrusted to where I'm going, which is my pathway is to bring wellness, to bring medicine, to share. Um, that's what I shared with him. And I told him underneath this cloth, because again, it was wrapped, uh, Charlie had put some uh, pheasant uh, feathers on here to represent to along when the eagle feathers went out there to rep again to represent all of us that are here on Turtle Island about sharing. And uh, so he he was just listening and and he found it fascinating. And at the meantime, as I'm telling the story, I noticed at first I started sharing with this one guard, the others started to kind of look around like they have no regard toward me. But as I finish a story, more and more of them were watching on and, and, and listening. So finally, the supervisor comes back and he said that they had just talked to Delta and they said they're gonna allow me to go on the plane with this under special circumstances. And they didn't ask me to remove the necklace, which the one guy came out and pointed at and said, that's not going on. And uh, in my heart, I knew that that was going to happen. I knew they were going to allow me. But they said that they had to carry it and that they had to escort me to the gate. So there I am walking to the gate to catch my flight to go to Red Lake, uh, Red Lake High School. And I'm going through the terminal there in Sky Harbor, uh, walking with my bag, and the guy walking ahead of me carrying this, and two armed guards <laughs> walking behind me. I mean, uh, it must have been crazy for anyone who was looking. It must have been crazy for anyone who just happened to look over. Um, so when I get to the gate, I meet the pilot, and the pilot walked right up to me, and he said, Mr. Johnston, I'm sorry for any convenience that has happened. I'm sorry for all of this. I, we really can't, we have no connection with TSA and what they're doing over there. But I'm gonna ask for your permission. It would be my honor if I could stow this in the cockpit with me and I can look after it personally for you. And I said, sure, you know. <clears throat> the options would be, you know, in the overhead. <laughs> but the, when the captain said that, I felt good. I felt like he was understood. And I felt that was prayers being answered, you know, uh, a calling being answered. And again, about this is that we're all in it together. So he did that. And then the uh, flight attendant, as I'm coming up and said, and, and again, the flight attendant who walked up, she said, oh, we reissued your ticket. Again, we want to thank you for coming on our flight and know that we apologize for everything. And I looked at my ticket and it said, uh, row one, C, C. That was my first time flying first class. I've never flown first class before. And in fact, I didn't even know that the seat, I thought there was a mistake because I didn't even look at the ticket. <laughs> when I got on the plane, I was actually looking like, okay. Then I looked at it, wait, there's a row one. Wait, that's like right here. And I looked at the, the uh, flight attendant. I think there's a mistake. She says, no, you're, you're sitting there. And I was like, wow, whoa. <laughs> and so that was my first time flying first class, but I felt really good because what I felt was you know, the calmness that happened. And, and, I, and I attribute it to what I would call that spiritual fast, taking myself away from entertainment. <clears throat> we call it entertainment, but it's really what we call the media. It's really what we call, when I say media, I'm talking about television. I'm talking about even like Netflix, all that, because what it's designed to do is connect with you on an emotional level. So that's why we love two types of uh, movies, or I say series, ones that are set, uh, com uh, have very high intense emotion which should be love or 
or sadness or fear. I mean, that's why we love those type of high emotion type of movies uh, and, and television shows. Um, but when I took myself away from that, you know, I wanted the one emotion to just rise and that was to be love and support and courage for these young people that I was going to go see at Red Lake. But so I get there. Now, this is a, a pretty crazy story because that's just the beginning. So I get there to Red Lake and I tell them about what happened with this and, and what I went through. And they just kind of laughed it off. And I said, but I'm here for you, whatever you need me to do. And what they shared, okay, well, this is what we want you to do. We want you to do a hypnosis show. <laughs> and I about like, what? Do you know what I went through to get this here? Because in my mind, you know, I saw myself with uh, some of their local healers and, and, and their local people doing prayers, singing some songs, just being with the young people, having them like through talking circles, all that stuff. And what they wanted me out of this was to do a hypnosis show. But again, it connected because what I realized what they wanted, what, you know, there's all types of medicine that we use and the medicine they were counting on was the medicine of laughter. And remember I told you what I pray, prayed for is for, you know, when I was there taking care of myself, I asked the creator to help me, is um, help me find whatever I have that's going to help them that I know whatever knowledge, whatever strength, help me find that and use it. And so what they wanted was that hypnosis show. So I did that for them and I've done it, I think 11 times since going out there. It's one of my favorite shows. It's one of my favorite things to do is go out to Red Lake and do the hypnosis for them. And I always get excited when I hear that, you know, they're waiting for me. But I wanted to share what the high school, what the intention was, what the, what the leadership was there doing. You see, when that day came along, whenever that day rolled around or that time rolled around, they didn't want it to be memorial. What they were doing, they were transitioning. They were transitioning uh, 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 to how we think. So that began a day that they do every year now. And they have a youth celebration and youth conference during that week. So nowadays, when that day comes along, no one's talking about, you know, again, this is 13, 14 years ago. When that day comes along, no one's talking about that incident. What people are talking about is the youth celebration. And what people are getting excited about these days because they know it's coming. Um, that's real forward thinking. That's great leadership purpose. And, you know, in a way, that's. You know, that's how mourning happens. You know, that's what true mourning is, is um, a shift in the way that you think of things. The energy, shifting the energy away from something. If we look at how our people have mourned in the past and how our people have uh, done tragedy, they look to shift the process and to shift the thinking about it and look at what is this, what is this time, what is it teaching us, but also is how can we transform this into something good that we can use how can we transform it into an energy that is powerful and healing? So <clears throat> that's that that was the experience. And I really, truly enjoyed my experience there at Red Lake. Uh, but that's not the end of the story of this particular step, because this went on. This went on this trip for a reason. And, and you're going to hear the reason why in a sec. So from there, from uh, Red Lake, uh, which is near Bemidji, uh, Minnesota, I flew all the way over to Oregon, to Portland, Oregon, and I had no problems with this at the airports and in, in Oregon or in uh, Minnesota. It was only in Arizona. So when I got to Oregon, I got picked up by Jolene Joseph, and we went to Grand Ronde, and Grand Ronde was having a youth uh, conference over there. And we went over there, and we were sharing with them. And one of the things that we share with the young people is that we had heard that the Dalai Lama was coming to um, the Seahawks Stadium in Washington. So we as an organization, all of us got tickets because we all wanted to go hear him speak. We all wanted to hear what he had to say. So we told those young people that we were excited to go listen to the Dalai Lama speak because his, his topic was compassion. So we told the, sto the students this story about going and they brought a blanket over to us and asked us to gift it to them. And again, 
uh, when I saw this, I was like, okay. I said, well, we're, we're going to probably be, like, up in the rafters. We're, you know, like, this is a stadium. He's going to be on the stage on the field. We're not going to be anywhere near him. And they, they said, well, would you take this and gift it to him? And I look over to Jolene, our, um, the Native Wellness Institute executive director, leader, and she gave them a smile and she said, yes. And so when we got in the car afterward, I was like, wow, they gave us that blanket to give Dalai Lama. And she just gave me this smile, like, who knows, it could happen. And I'm like, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Through all the security, you know. You know, at the time, we're talking like uh, during that time of period, we also know like um, the Dalai Lama was a pretty big target as far as people wanting something bad to happen to him worldwide, you know, um, because of his talk about what he did and because of certain things that have gone on. We were going there to listen to his speech about compassion and here we are like just these native people who just want to hear these good words. So, uh, so we leave there and then we drive up to Washington. So we had heard, we got, it sounded like we had the opportunity because the Dalai Lama was going to come speak to the native congregation that was, was there. So all the native people there were asked to come to this room and the Dalai Lama would come address us. So we were excited about that. So we all dressed up, we all put on our best, you know, uh, 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 whatever we had, buttskin dresses. I put on my ribbon shirt, put on my necklace and uh, everything that I could. Everyone else, we all got ready. Charlie was in full regalia, looked beautiful. So was wife, uh, Nancy. A lot, all of our women were in full regalia. And, uh, and I had my stick. So we go there to this room where all these natives, and you can imagine just a room full of just so many indigenous people standing there looking great, beautiful, everyone in their traditional, uh, traditional regalia. And then we are told that the Dalai Lama had to take a phone call and was unable to meet with us. So if we could all please just make our way to our seats for the address that he was gonna do. But they were asking for anyone too, if they would like to be a part of a, um, what you would call a, a entourage that would uh, go out into the field and they had all these drummers from all these different cultures and we would follow them out to the field. And once you get to the field, they would release everyone to go back up to their seats. Uh, this uh, procession to come out while the Dalai Lama was already on stage. So um, we we said, yeah, we'll do it. You know, we didn't come here dressed up for nothing. So we uh, said that we would do it. So when the, everyone started to clear out and we just went in this hallway and we're just still talking about what we were going to do. But we also, because we got these tickets, not all of us were sitting close to each other. So we were kind of going over the tickets, who's sitting where, who's sitting where. And everyone's like, hurry, hurry, hurry. This procession's going to start. But you know us, we're always kind of like tagging along late. But, <laughs> but everyone else went down, but we're just standing there and still in this hallway. And then this uh, security officer walks up all black. When you talk like all black, I mean like all black. Um, like, uh, 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 like the men in black, like look with the sunglasses, earpiece, everything, comes right to us and says, everyone against the wall. Now, after everything that we went through with this, my first thought, here we go again. Here we go again. And I could handle it. You know, when that happened in the airport with securities coming out and telling me, do this, do that, I could handle it. But when I saw the security going toward our elder, toward Charlie and Nancy, with that same get against the wall, there is a part of me that just no. And I stepped in front of Charlie and said, don't touch them. Don't talk to them like that. And the security looked at me kind of weird. Um, but I thought, okay, here it comes. But it was actually Charlie who grabbed me on the shoulder, pulled me back and said, get against the wall. <laughs> and I said, okay, Charlie. And we all stood against the wall. And then all these security people come walking in. And what they're trying to, you know, it's just a, 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 they're, they're, this procession that was going from one end of the hallway to the other. We just saw them all. 
and it was one of those moments where everything just kind of still, uh, you know, real slow. But what you saw in the center of all those black suits and security was this little orange robe flapping around. And that side. Of and when that happened, um, they stopped right in front of us. This procession stopped right in front of us. And almost like a wave opened up a door. The security moved out of the way. And that orange robe came walking toward us. The Dalai Lama. And he walked right up to us with this big old smile on his face. The way his face looked and the way his hands were out, it was as if he was just not only giving, but receiving love. It says almost he is just throwing love out in the entire room, but at the same time taking in every type of love that was being given in that room. And as he walked up, he walked straight to Charlie, our elder. And Dalai Lama, you know, the, the, he's a small man. And Charlie had to bend down to him. But they put their heads close to each other. And they had this conversation to each other's ears. And you could hear them talking. You could see them talking. It wasn't loud. It's almost like whispers. But you could just see their mouths moving and talking and the smiles on their faces. And when he was done, he gives this blessing to Charlie. And then he moves on to Nancy. Uh, Charlie's partner and he gives her just the biggest hug and then he walks toward me and I'm just frozen and Charlie's like give me your stick give me your stick <laughs> so I had this drumstick <laughs> in my pocket I pulled out that drumstick and handed it to Dalai Lama and Charlie said no your stick and I was like oh and I gave him the staff and he held it in his hands. And I saw him close his eyes as he moved his hands over it. And I saw him speaking. And he hands it back to me. And I realized he had just gave him blessing to this staff. Like he understood what it was and what it was used for. He felt the love in this, in this staff. So he goes down the line to Jolene, to Maria, to Theta, to, to uh, Amanda, to, to everyone that was there. And we, our hearts were just so filled. Our hearts were just like in disbelief. <clears throat> and when he was finally done, he moved back over there to the line and they went on out to the stage. And then we go down and we're, part, we're, we're like, high-fiving like we just won you know nfl the super bowl <laughs> and, and we get down there to the line ready to go out onto the field and we go out there and we all and, and, and you know we all have our drums we're all out there playing boom 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 onto the field we get out there and we realize you know everyone's on the jumbotron as, as we move on this field and then we see charlie like the crowd's going crazy and i look over at charlie and charlie's going like this on full regalia, our elder out there on the field going like that. And I look up on the Jumbotron and that, that screen has Charlie on the big screen and the whole stadium is going crazy for Charlie. And he just made us drum harder and sing harder. And that, that was truly an amazing experience. And then we got the word that the Dalai Lama was going to meet with us after all, uh, with all the native people. So we went there and we were able to present him the blanket that was a gift from the Grand Ron youth, um, uh, the, the Tilcom youth. And what an amazing story that was. And when I look back, you know, that story with uh, so many ups and downs with it, the, the thing that stays in my mind is kind of what we're going through right here. And that is this, this idea about what faith is and this idea about you know, we had to take care of ourselves during this time. And I think one that, that spiritual fast, what I talked about was reconnecting with the spirit. And there's so many things that can really cause us to be up and down in our emotion and in our spirit. And a lot of it is fed to us. You know, we had to realize that, yes, that the media is a source of information, but the media is a source of entertainment, too. And part of entertaining, and entertainment doesn't necessarily mean delighting us. Entertainment means keeping us watching. And again, most of that is emotion 
uh, emotion filled. So you're going to have uh, um, scary fear. You're going to have sad loss. Uh, you're going to have love stories as well. But that's why we have to be very aware of what's being put out there. Um, because that's what's fed. And I look back when I took the, even if it was just three days, when the first incident happened with those guards with their guns drawn on me because I was carrying this. Think about what, I, what actions could have happened. Even to the sense of me not taking this with me. You know, um, Jolene Joseph has this beautiful saying, which is, we can't let other people's unhealthy behaviors uh, take us away from our healthy ones. And what I realized when those guards came out with their guns, they were reacting off of fear. They were reacting off of things that were going on in the world, but they were reacting off of fear because they had no understanding of me or this. And my reaction was to not test those fears, to be strong and courageous, to be the opposite of that fear. Um, they were disengaged, meaning not looking at me, except for that one, that one officer who did open up to me. So I shared with him and that opened up to all of them, you know, that understanding, that teaching, that sharing. And to go from that to a place of compassion, the Seeds of Compassion Conference, to having one of the uh, one of this uh, big spiritual leaders of the world to look at this and know exactly what it was uh, at first sight. You know, these things happen because we had to have faith in our medicines. We had to have faith in our teachings. We had to have faith in ourselves that we're doing things with good intent, that we're doing things to make things happen in a good way for our people. You know, um, that is just one of the stories. Uh, I'm going to share one more real quick one uh, because it goes along with the intent. And when we say have faith and let thing, let the process work as it is. Um, this, by the way, is uh, from Australia. First people. Shout out to Joe Day. But uh, this is also from Australia. This beautiful gift here. Um, if you didn't know about the, the Aboriginal tribes, Australia, they do smudge. They do eagle feathers with their, well, with their smoke ceremonies. Um, and they're very beautiful people. Did we do? Um, I have not performed about best I could do. <laughs> but they're, they, they're just beautiful people who give so many of their gifts and share many with their gifts. Um, kangaroo. What do we also have? We have some paint. Uh, they use body paints in their dances. Uh, so this is what they use from the earth, uh, what they grind into their paint. Uh, but we have an emu egg. One of their art forms is painting emu eggs. Emu. That's my Australian brother right there. The koala. Uh, they do basketry. One of the baskets they have out there. But I just wanted to share you this quick story. Oh, to end, like the Choctaw people, you ever hear them saying, you know, the sticks? Well, so do the Aboriginal um, indigenous people of Australia. Also, But, uh, you know, so similar, so many similarities, right? So, so many similarities. And that's because they used to Google our people. Ah, just kidding. No, there's a spiritual connection, right? There's a spiritual connection. And, um, but the story I'm going to share in a little bit of time I have left is actually about this sucker right here. All right. 
This is a Mong Group ball. And what is a Mong Group ball? Actually, let me put that tail in because that tail is not supposed to be showing when you play. But um, the Mong Group is a traditional Aboriginal game from Australia that the tribal people there used to play. And it's a game of football. And um, just recently, like in, I think it was last year, the commissioner for the uh, Australian Rules Football uh, made a statement that the game of Australian Rules Football that they call footy is derived from the Mongroot game that the uh, indigenous people played. Not a lot of people were happy about that, um, but it's the truth, you know. And uh, this we got... Um, this is what we uh, were gifted. Well, not this one. We were gifted uh, a Mongroot ball, or actually uh, we got to meet the creator of the Mongroot ball, and we were told that there was only one left in that area. And she made this uh, ball, and uh, we got her information, and we left, and we were so excited. And I was excited because I had uh, learned about the Mongru. You know, I, I love to learn about indigenous games and purpose of indigenous games. I always wanted to see this. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, I, I always wanted to see where, um, how, 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 how these indigenous games have affected what we say, not affected, but, uh, uh, affected, but uh, um, how we, a lot of what we see is modern day, professional sports games have derived from indigenous games and all the history of, of behind it. But I'd never seen a mongroup ball. What I knew about a mongroup ball is made from possum. And so when we were able to get this uh, mongroup ball and I took it back with me over here to share with people. And I, I love the story about the game. And a year, uh, a year later, we went back to Australia for Healing Our Spirits Worldwide. And I was doing a, um, I was doing, oh yes, thanks for reminding me. By the way, these small feathers are emu feathers that are up here, along with the eagle feather. But I was doing a workshop on traditional games. And I brought up the Mong Group Ball. And again, this is in Sydney, Australia. And a, a lot of my attendees, their eyes got wide. Is, is that a mongroup ball? Okay, that sounds Scottish. It didn't sound Australian. Anyway, they were, <laughs> they were really excited. A lot of them had never seen one before. And so they were, they were excited. So we passed around. And afterward, uh, they were playing with it. And so uh, one of the uh, attendees there, who was a part of our congregation there from Native Wellness, I asked him to... Uh, I had to go to another workshop with Charlie, so I asked him if he could uh, take care of that mongroot ball for us, and he said he would. So <clears throat> went to the other workshop, and then we met up uh, later on, and as it turns out, um, he thought he put the mongroot ball in my bag, and to this day, we don't know if it was the wrong bag or, or what if someone came and took it out of there, because you know these are very hard to find, and, um, you know, I'm sure it would cost a lot of money in Australia. So uh, we, we had a, so what, we went looking all over. We went looking for this ball in my mind. And let me tell you what was going on during that time. I was so down on myself because I was telling myself, you got this ball that was shared with you a year ago and you took it home and you shared it with all these people to take care of and it's no blame against anyone else it was me it's my fault I was given this beautiful sacred item and I didn't do my job in taking care of it that's what's going on so I had this frantic frantic uh, I mean literally going to look in trash cans literally going all over this place convention center looking for it just really out of sync uh, near tears, just like felt so devastated that I could allow that to happen. And then when I realized there just wasn't going to be a possible way of finding it, I went to the restroom, really just to calm myself down and put some water on my face. 
and as I was doing that, I just thought about the other things that we'd done that day. One of the things that remind that I thought of when I put water on my face is earlier that day we recorded a video, and outside the convention center there was this ball rolling in this water in this fountain. And Gene Tagabon, he put on his raven mask and his wings, and he went out on that ball while Levina and uh, Josh Cocker sang, sang in this beautiful song, and he danced. And all these people, you know, in Australian Sydney, you got all types of uh, uh, people with different backgrounds from all these different nations come over and they watch. And I was thinking of that. And it's like, you know what? We've done so much beautiful things here. And think about this. Yes, you had this ball, but this ball belongs here. You took it home for a visit. You took it home with you to, to the United States to let it visit other tribes, to let it visit indigenous people over here and then you brought it back and now it's home because i thought wherever it might be whoever might have picked it up and taken it it belongs there on australia ground whoever took it that's what came over me and i started to imagine young people playing with it but also to to play with it have to learn how to play it so asking their elders how do you play this game and being taught this game and elders being so happy to see a mon group ball right and, I, and all of a sudden, this just joy came over me, and I just felt so good. I felt good about me being part of that. And so I came out of the restroom. I was fine. I felt great. And, you know, went on to have a good evening. Went with the NWI folk. We went and had a good dinner. Actually, we went out and we had our last dinner with some of our friends from Australia. And one of our uh, good, 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 good uh, uh, friends, Nolita Edwards, we were sitting there, and uh, she found out what was happening. She goes, I can't believe that happened. Oh, I'm so angry. And I said, no, no, no. This is why. you got. It. This is fine. You know why? Because it's home. And the people that are learning, that, that have it now, they get to learn about it. it they get to share about it. And again, she was, she was really upset. Said, but it shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have happened. I said, I, you know, I'm fine. I'm good. It's home. It's home. So Nolita, this strong woman who was just uh, mesmerized by, by by what happened. Like, she couldn't believe it, you know, and she was just focused on that. My last thing was her, you know, what we got to learn is what's the lesson that we get out of this? And something, we got to really believe that something good's going to happen out of this, Nolita. Well, something good happened out of this. See, Nolita went home, and she made this. She didn't know how, but she learned and with her daughter, they made it a family project. And they got the possum. And they couldn't get the possum from Australia, so they had to bring in the possum from New Zealand. They left the tail on. They actually left this part. Usually it would close. It really does look like a furry football, a uh, furry Nerf football, actually, when you do see it. Uh, but she left the tail there so people could see, you know, the insides of it. And inside you see... Uh, uh, some of, uh, I'm trying to see what in there is, there's some emu feathers that are in there, but it's also packed with, uh, some of the, uh, 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 the, uh, shreddings of wood there to keep it, give it its, uh, form. But yeah, and these eagle feathers that are right here. Um, but to think about how this particular type of incident how it turned into something very healing for Nolita, how it turned into a lesson for all of us. You know, that's what I love about indigenous people because indigenous people are more than just work off of emotion. Indigenous people, truly what they are is what we say indigenous thinkers. They are positive thinkers. They are big picture thinkers. They are generational thinkers. And if you're a positive thinker and generational thinker, and big picture thinker, then you're always in thought of what are the best possibility outcomes of the situation? What do I have to give to that next generation? What do I want them to take from this? What do I want to pass down? And I think that's the true essence of who we are, which calls to our resiliency. When we talk about resiliency, that's it in a nutshell of our willingness to share, of our willingness to look on 
the positive aspects of things and to take action to it as well. So I wanted to share these uh, two stories, these two different stories, but I think they all come to the same thing. And that is that during this time, we're going to be tested on our faith. We're going to be tested on just our emotions, really. And if we need to take time to just, you know, pour, put some water on our face or go through a spiritual fast, if that's what it takes, and that's what it takes. Because the end run is that we're a part of something. We're a part of a generation that gives you know, when we're always talking about the circle and about the circle of life, one of those teachings about the circle of life is the elderhood teaching. And that elderhood teaching is we're two things always in our lifetime. We're a student and we're a teacher. And our indigenous way, our way of being relies on that. That when you talk about the wisdom of our elders and we talk about our young people needing to learn, it's not a direct line. What it is, it's a circle, and we're a part of that circle. We're a part of taking, and we're a part of giving and sharing. And we play a big part of that. So the call out here to all of us is to remember that and how we handle this situation. And what do we teach our younger generations and have a handle future? And what can we learn from looking at some of our elders? You know, I get the comfort in, in thinking about my mom and how she's handling this all very well, still exercising, still finding ways to exercise, still finding ways to dance, uh, still being encouraged, still being the person that she is, but taking care of herself, uh, adjusting how she takes care of herself because of what's going on. So I just want to share that with you. I want to thank you all for being here with us today. You know, uh, just... Um, I, uh, I want to thank Jolene Joseph. And you know, Jolene, she's awesome woman, had a lot to share with you today. Uh, however, the internet at her house wasn't working, and I think her and Sh Shailene finally got it working now. So we hope to hear back from her soon. But again, just thank you for being here with us. Uh, tomorrow we have some beautiful songs. Oh, and I think too, uh, Native Wellness, if you can please let me know, is this a Nikwa? Uh, sponsored event uh, so I can give shout out to them sometimes I not sure if it's noise or Nikwa that is sponsoring what we're doing here today but I um, but I do want to uh, give a shout out tomorrow to we have we had a really great great response to the day we had some indigenous singings from these uh, three lovely ladies they're going to be back on again tomorrow sharing some songs with you um, we also have on Wednesday, my bro, my brother from another uh, mother, we have MC1, Marcus Gwynn is going to be on here. This is a good one. If you have young people, uh, this would be a great one for them to jump on. This is called being old school in the new school, meaning how do we take these traditional values and use them in today's uh climate in today's world and if you know mc1 he's a great speaker and he speaks very well to young people uh that would be a great day to have your teenagers or young people sit on sit in on it and listen to mc1 he has some great great sharing to uh give and then on thursday and by the way shout out to national indian child welfare association nikwa for their support and sponsoring this. Uh, then on Thursday, we have story time with Renee Roman Nose. Yes, awesome energy. She's going to be sharing some stories. Then on Friday, we have Let's Talk About Sex, Approaches to Help Adults Talk to Their Children with, uh, let me zoom in on this, Nona, Nona Main, who's going to be interviewed by Jolene Joseph. So Jolene will be here on Friday. And I'm sorry for those that tuned in, ready to see Jolene's smiling face. You'll get to see her on Friday, uh, Saturday, uh, Friday though. And again, tune in tomorrow with Healing Through Song with Kalina Lawrence, Jordan Cocker, and Kahara Hodges. Mado, Yokoki to all of you. Enjoy your day. Take care. Be well. Bye.